um, we're still working with getting those branches staffed. Um, we'll be happy to see you when you come visit us. And at that, I would like to introduce our presenter, Paul Herman, the founder and CEO of HIP, which stands for Human Impact and Profit Investor Incorporated. This is based in San Francisco. Herman is also an author of two books accessible in the library, The Hip Investor, Make Bigger Profits by Building a Better World, that was published by Wiley in 2010, and The Global Handbook of Impact Investing, also published by Wiley in 2021. Please welcome Paul Herman. Thanks, Leah, and uh, hello, everybody. Delighted to be with you today. <clears throat> a um, another summer day in San Francisco. Um, uh, Leah remembered that uh, in my first book <clears throat> that came out in 2010, presented that at the Petrero branch where Leo, Leah was uh, working. So delighted that uh, she and Doreen can uh, host us today and uh, uh, excited to tell you more about how you might be able to do more good with your portfolio and your 401k. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat or the question box. Ask them along the way. You know, this is a webinar, so we can make this interactive along the way, just like uh, as close as we can be to being in person. And um, uh, and what's already in the chat are uh, names of the books uh, that uh, I've written. The presentation will be available afterwards, so um, uh, know that. Uh, you can you will get this uh, via uh, PDF so you can review it and uh, let's get started and again please ask questions along the way. So we like kicking off the conversation about sustainable and responsible investing with this image. Now I'd be curious uh, for each of you if you have a reaction to this image is this inspiring or depressing. Uh, we considered using it for the cover of our latest book, but a lot of people actually said, oh, please don't use that. That makes me want to, you know, depressed and I don't want to read your book. So we use it in presentations to show that a more utopian world can happen on the right of the screen. And kind of left is more of a dystopian world, as Anoop just said. Um, and so we have the choice of which way we want to go. And, and um, this is also how we look at the world when we're investing and when we're <clears throat> um, managing portfolios for investors, and when we help rate portfolios for investors, including um, 401ks. So uh, just before we get started, so the lawyers and the regulators are happy. I'm Paul Herman. I'm a registered representative and investment advisor uh, registered in the state of California, Illinois, and Washington State. We have clients uh, across the country. We have clients in other states, um, depending on how many we have, we register there or not. And we also have a ratings company, kind of like a morning star for impact, um, so that you can understand is a company, uh, a bond, a muni bond, a fund, uh, or other type of investment, is that more net positive or more net negative? Now, remember, this is all for your education and information. So this is not, these are not investment recommendations. You should do your own research or ask your own advisor. Uh, and that all investing has risks and that uh, the stock market uh, and other assets can go up or down in price, including things like cryptocurrency. So these are the two books that Leah introduced. The Hip Investor on the left is a great way to get started if you're interested in learning about sustainable, responsible investing. <clears throat> While it was written 11 years ago and did become a bestseller and is in libraries around the world, more than 146 global libraries, including the San Francisco Public Library, um, it's been translated into Polish, uh, my heritage. Um, and more recently, uh, we've, uh, Wiley has published uh, the Global Handbook of Impact Investing that you see on the right. And that's available in uh, ebook, which is good because it's 1300 pages. So it's bigger than War and Peace. Uh, there's more peace than war, <clears throat> and um, it covers a variety of these topics. What's the value of human capital? You know, we hear CEOs say people are our most important asset, but they're not always on the financial statements. Uh, we hear about fossil fuel-free investing and the value of nature. How can we put a price on 
um, what we use in nature, including how bees pollinate honey or the soil regenerates um, and the like. So this is much more dense than the first book. So uh, feel free to check them out either at the library or uh, collect um, for your own uh, personal reading. And then <clears throat> over the summer, I wrote for Barron's Financial Magazine, five books um, <clears throat> that are insightful about how to do sustainable investing. Bill Gates about how to avoid a climate disaster. If you're not yet familiar with what's going on, that's a good one. Uh, Janine Furpo, she's a local author, uh, wrote Activate Your Money uh, with a group of collaborators. So that gives more detail about what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, Making Money Moral um, by the Wharton uh, 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 finance team. So that's my alma mater, the War Wharton School of Business. Uh, Alex Edmonds, who used to teach at Wharton, now teaches at London Business School, Grow the Pie. And then some of you may be familiar with Donut Economics, because there's actually a working group for California on Donut Economics and how to have more stakeholder um, engagement uh, and stakeholder capitalism. So you can probably find these in the library. So check them out. And again, so uh, you can uh, have the presentation after. All right, so without trying to be too depressing or too dystopian, we are facing five crises of our time. And these five crises, we actually built our framework around 15 years ago when I started Hip Investor. <clears throat> and those uh, are based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we have health, uh, physical and mental health, including COVID uh, these days, wealth, especially income inequality, Earth, uh, certainly the climate crisis is one of the top earth crises. Equality, <clears throat> racial equality as uh, we became even more elevated last year. And trust, there is a crisis of trust. Uh, people, many people don't trust institutions anymore. So these five elements were their pillars, we call them when we evaluate an investment. These are five crises, but not to worry, there's things we can do about it. There's new metrics for how to measure what's going well or not so well in the world. There's ways to innovate <clears throat> in your investing approach. And there's a looking across multi-sector. So we're gonna have three mini discussions in each of these. Feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll answer them along the way. And we'll get very tangible about what you can do. So to kick this off, <clears throat> this is a little quantitative, but for those of you who know accounting statements, not everything is on the financial statements of a company. In fact, uh, back in 1975, uh, most of it was, there was a lot of manufacturing plants and inventory, things that we usually think of with a traditional business. But business today is much more people oriented, service oriented, or some of those manufacturing jobs have moved overseas. So when you're looking at a company, uh, one of the 500 largest companies in the US, the S&P 500, 84% um, of that value is not on the financial statements. People are represented as costs, not as assets. The use of natural resources is off those financial statements. And so to invest more responsibly, you can see right here for in the dark green, four themes that you can apply to investing in your portfolio. One is looking at people as an asset, as many CEOs claim, but don't always pursue. And measurements of that can include things like customer satisfaction, driven by employee satisfaction and employee retention. And an increasing number of companies report these measures. So one of the questions before the webinar was, how do I pick which company? One way to do that is to look at what they're disclosing about how they treat employees, how they pay employees, we work with a nonprofit called As You Sow at asyousow.org on rating overpaid CEOs for each year of the past, past uh, seven years. Um, a second theme is the natural resource efficiency. How do companies use oil and water and energy? Um, and again, an increasing number of companies are disclosing how they're using these natural resources. And there's even a, a, a theme called valuing uh, nature. Uh, that there's an increasing number of books and research papers around. And even back at the turn of the millennium, a group of European <clears throat> and global scientists said, if we paid nature for all that we use from nature, it would be for every dollar of GDP, it would be two additional dollars. And so if we actually paid nature and soil and the bees uh, for what they did, 
almost no business would be profitable. So using those resources efficiently um, is one way to have a successful business and uh, potentially a successful investment. A third theme is um, making sure that the board of directors and the team is representative of the people that they serve. Does the board reflect half men and half women? Does the board reflect the diversity of people that are served, uh, including um, uh, nonprofits that uh, work with nature and people? And then finally, transparency. If you can't see inside the company, how do you evaluate risks? So, um, so in innovative metrics, one of the things that uh, we encourage everybody to do to be a sustainable investor is look up the information either from the company itself, which they report on their website, or in reports called sustainability reports, or corporate social responsibility reports, or impact reports. Um, or in some cases, there's databases um, that can provide this information. And one of those that does so around greenhouse gas emissions uh, is Fossil Free Funds at fossilfreefunds.org. And that tells you how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions are inside a mutual fund. Um, and we'll cover that again later in our discussion. Um, so just to put a finer point on it, you say, what's the state of today? Um, the state is that 92% of the 500 largest companies in the US have diversity policies. That's good, 92% out of it. But only 19% have actual metrics of tracking gender diversity, racial diversity, and similar. So we need to close this gap. We need to close the gap between actual metrics where we can track performance versus a promise through a policy. An increasing number of companies are instituting a fair wage of $15 an hour or higher. Target uh, is one of the first to have done this. Bank of America is committed to $20 an hour. You may disagree with how these companies operate in other ways, but there is increasing competition for labor and for good jobs and setting that fair wage that $15 an hour is only $30,000 a year if you work a full year, or $20 an hour is $40,000 a year. So that might be a tougher wage to live with in a city versus a county. Uh, and the average CEO pay has continued to spiral out of control. And there's a lot of reporting uh, to the government um, uh, on this. And uh, unfortunately, CEOs continue to get overpaid while everyday workers don't get paid enough. In natural resources, there's something called science-based targets. So the science-based targets initiative is put on by the Carbon Disclosure Project, the World Resources Institute and others. And it's tracking the more than 1000 companies around the world who say science is important. And more than 800 companies actually have a target like Levi Strauss says, we're gonna reduce greenhouse gas emissions 95% by 2025. They have a lot of work to do to get there. Stanley Black & Decker, you might have their tools in your garage. Um, they've committed to 100% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030. And so that means every year from now till 2030, they'll have to reduce it eight to 10% every year, year after year. And last year under COVID, greenhouse gas emissions worldwide went down five to 10%, but have already uh, come back with the recovery. So this is a new innovations we have to focus on. And so companies like Tesla, with electric vehicles or beyond meat with um, uh, meatless food uh, proteins. Those are companies that are trying to um, bring these new solutions to market. And hence, while um, they may be a focus for sustainable, responsible investors. Um, we also have uh, board and gender diversity. We'll show you a chart in just one second that shows we still have uh, a ways to go to be at equality or parity. And then one of our favorite um, uh, metrics is actually lawsuits. So if you read the annual report or the what's in the SEC calls the 10K report, companies have to report who's suing them, who they expect to sue them, and for how much. And what we found over 15 years of analyzing companies for being sustainable, responsible, or impactful is that um, the more you get sued as a company, the more risky you are as an investment. Um, one, it takes away time for managers to focus on it. Two, it's sometimes you have to settle or lose a court case. You have brand risk, the stock price may fall. So companies that don't get sued generally are in balance with customers, employees, environment, uh, and government. And companies who do get sued are pushing it and sometimes over the line or up to the line, but it's out of balance. Um, 
All right, so let me show you, let's talk about climate for a second, because this is a, um, uh, this is something that there's a information and an education gap around. Um, the Paris commitments um, that you may have seen talked about in the news, they're encouraging countries around the world, all countries around the world and the institutions inside them to only raise the global temperature, to only conduct activities that raise the global temperature up to one and a half or two degrees Celsius. Now you might think that it's like, oh, well, we live in San Francisco. It's 60 degrees today. It could be 62 or 64, that's not too bad. But this is a global temperature. This is an average around the whole world. And that we live in a balance, just like our bodies live in a balance. Our temperature is 98 degrees inside our body, like you see on the right-hand side. So another one and a half or two degrees Celsius, when you convert to Fahrenheit and add that to your body temperature, if our body temperature is like the Earth's body temperature, and you have a, you have a temperature of 101 or 102, you have a fever. You don't feel that great. You might want to stay in bed. You might be contagious too. Um, and current behavior in the whole um, uh, investable world is there's estimates that if we just continue investing the way we do today, the Earth's temperature could grow four, five, six degrees Celsius, which is another seven or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which means your body temperature would go to 105 to 109. There's not many people who survive a temperature of 109 and 105 people there's, you know, um, that you, you have something dramatically wrong with your body. This is what we have to avoid. So this is the per one of the purposes of sustainable responsible investing is finding the companies, muni bonds, mutual funds that are investing in more efficient companies, companies with aggressive targets. Muni bonds that have the use of proceeds like city of San Francisco does for green purposes, to be more efficient with energy, uh, to put in uh, sensors, to um, uh, put in bioswales to help drain water from flooding. All right, so let's just pause here for questions. We've covered a lot. I see uh, there's some questions in the question box, which a little bit, um, uh, both of them actually are about inflation. Leah, do you wanna describe them at all? Um, so, the first one is how likely do you think it is that the United States will enter a period of high inflation like during the 1970s within the next 10 years? Great. Um, yeah, so this is a hot topic. Uh, for those of you who are tracking interest rates, you can look it up at the Federal Reserve, which has a website called FRED, F-R-E-D. And um, interest rates in the 1970s used to be 10% or higher. Uh, some of you may have had mortgages that were 10, 12, 14% if you had a house mortgage in the 1970s. And since then, interest rates have come down globally for the most part, including in the US. And, um, and the reason they've come down is a couple of reasons. One, we've understood how to um, eliminate more risks, though now the next wave of risks is coming. So that is a risk that interest rates could go up. Interest rates are approximating zero now. So it's hard to have interest rates lower than zero, though it's happening in Europe. So if, if you're in Germany and you put your money in a bank, they have negative interest. And so you won't get all of your money back. You'll get a small deduction back for negative interest rates. Um, in addition, um, uh, another risk is um, things like other currencies. So cryptocurrency is emerging. Uh, some younger people and uh, people of all ages are investing in cryptocurrencies thinking, wow, maybe I should have an independent currency of a, of a country. That may not survive. The, the, the fiat currencies may not um, uh, easily permit independent uh, cryptocurrencies from continuing without some regulation. So there's definitely a possibility of uh, higher interest rates. But what our elements against that are, um, we have a global workforce and we're all on a Zoom webinar right now. And so several of us, you know, many of us can work uh, remotely. And that means that the supply of labor is global, not just local or national. So that's another pressure. If you look at the labor rates around the world, um, it's going from like a curve to a flat base. And that's been happening for the past several years. And um, our view is that it will continue to happen. 
But a different theme that you may want to think about uh, independent of interest rates is self-sufficiency. So back in 2018, 2019, we had um, uh, wildfires in Napa, Sonoma, rest of California. And that's where we came up with a theme called um, uh, self-sufficiency and radically decentralized self-sufficiency. And so this is like, if you need healthcare, can you get healthcare locally? If you need energy, do you have a generator? If you need food, can you grow food in your backyard? Like, what are you dependent on outside of your house, your community, your state, your country from around the world? And we even saw that when the Suez Canal got blocked earlier, um, that uh, impacted global trade um, for at least a week and rippling through. So there's lots of risks uh, to evaluate. And how we, um, when we're constructing ratings on an investment or a portfolio uh, or managing portfolios for investors, we think about all these risks and we pursue the ones that are more, um, that see this sustainable, responsible world and are investing in solutions related to that. So I'll pause right there. Um, so hopefully that was a appropriate, um, you know, uh, thought process for talking about inflation and other future risks. And this is the thing about any portfolio, future risk is, is your criteria. And so I think that relates to this next question from uh, Christina, which is a little bit long, but uh, Leah, do you wanna share what that is? I think that when you, she's, it's too um, personalized. I think you, she gave an email to answer her directly. Okay. Okay, but okay. the other question was um, what type of investments do well during periods of high inflation? Okay, yeah, Christine, I'll follow up with you on your more detailed question. Um, yeah, so during, if inflation returns, um, what you want are companies that um, sometimes have uh, what's called real assets. So um, those could be real estate and real estate, you know, real estate like a house or property. Um, or real estate investment trusts, REITs, uh, they're known as. So those are some uh, materials if the inflation is being driven by higher oil or metals prices, um, that could be helpful, but commodities have not, traditional commodities have not done that great uh, in the past decade. So we'll see if that changes in the coming decade. Commodities that could do good in the coming decade are water and clean water sustainable forestry, there's companies in sustainable forestry, there's companies and mutual funds in clean water. Um, there's also rare earths like lithium, which goes into batteries that go into rechargeable, renewable batteries. So sort of going sector by sector, you can see that. And some of the inflation right now, like if you go to Costco today or to the grocery store today, um, you know, my toothpaste used to be eight ounces, now it's 6.8 ounces. It's the same price, but they're giving you less. So there's some invisible inflation that's happening there. But um, with a global market for labor, uh, with hyper competition among businesses, uh, unless you have a monopoly, um, price pressure generally is lower. The good news is there's some uh, inflation potential from employees starting to get paid a fairer wage, and that may ripple through. So uh, things to be concerned about are high labor cost business, um, labor intensive businesses may have some more inflationary pressures on them. Um, let's see, so uh, Leah, there's another question about diversity and diversity metrics. Um, how can a person find the 8% of companies that do not have diversity policies or the 19% of companies with diversity metrics? Yeah, great question. Um, more and more tools uh, are starting to emerge uh, to pick these up, but there's no easy way um, to do this. So the hard way to do it is look it up one by one yourself. That's obviously time intensive. Um, we put that chart together, so we actually have the list. So that's something we do publishing around is to uh, call out companies on that list of who doesn't have a policy and why. Frequently, it's the newer companies to the S&P 500, um, uh, so the growing ones that are starting to become big. Most big companies have those policies. But the ones with metrics are actually interesting. Uh, we just did this recently for the Dow Jones um, 30 industrials. And it turns out um, only um, 
uh, the ones that have metrics are only about half of names that we all know. So good ones are salesforce.com and Apple and Travelers Insurance and Visa. And they're now publishing what is a required government document called the EEO-1, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity One form. And most companies over 50 or 100 people have to report this, but traditionally it's been, um, traditionally it's been um, uh, confidential. But there's enough after last year's, um, uh, after George Floyd last year and racial protests, um, the heat has turned up on businesses to have these metrics, report these metrics. And, um, but there's companies like IBM and Procter and Gamble, which are diverse internally, but they're not reporting their metrics. It's really funny. So um, yeah, happy to follow up with you on the specific companies um, that we found in our research. Um, all right, so uh, please ask more questions along the way. This is being recorded. The PDF will be available afterwards. Um, if you don't know this yet, one of the things if you study, um, like where, where are all these environmental impacts coming from? Um, there's something called scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one is what happens inside the company. Scope two is the energy you buy, like from PG&E, which is one of the highest renewable portions of utility energy in the country, as opposed to like Kentucky or uh, West Virginia, which is heavy in coal. And then scope three, this is where a lot of uncertainty is. This is what, product, what impact your products have. So Procter & Gamble invented cold water tide because part of their analysis was, do you need to use hot water when you clean? And hot water helps clean clothes. So that's how they came up with cold water tide is, could we save customers money on energy by uh, having a cold water tide product instead of warm or hot water tide? Another one is uh, yogurt. Um, so yogurt you know, comes from dairy, which comes from cows. Cows, a lot of cows in the US eat grain, but cows aren't built to eat grain. Cows, cows are built to eat grass. And so when cows eat grain, it's a little bit disagreeable. And so they burp and create methane or they fart actually. And so this, uh, so dairy companies um, like Stonyfield Farm said, all right, we're only going with grass fed cows because that's how cows were built over thousands and millions of years. So these are the types of things, you know, and McDonald's is doing a deep dive into its supply chain to figure out how to A, one, you know, put, uh, uh, have more sustainable meat that it serves, or like Burger King has, you know, made a big bet into Beyond Burgers and serving Beyond Burgers. All right, so that's just a, you know some additional vocabulary that you might see if you um, uh, do this. So climate is one of the big threats. You know, we've talked about inflation, but this is a, a big future risk going forward is climate. This is a 3,000 county map of the U.S. You can see all the counties in California and other states. And you can see that red is more at risk and less resilient. And that's coming from Florida, Texas, the South, also the coasts uh, where there's water risk. It also comes from the policy. So the um, uh, policy of some states is not yet acknowledging uh, climate. So you need to factor that into how you think about the world. So. Um, all right, so here's the chart over time in terms of like diversity. You can see the policy gradually going up over time and the metrics gradually going up over time, but there's still this huge gap. Uh, and we think that's a difference between action and aspiration. Um, and then um, women on boards. Um, it's still women on boards are in this 35 to 40% range. Women are half the population. They're more than half of the university graduates. They're more than half of grad school graduates. Um, and so we think that more women will um, make their way onto boards, especially as there's more stakeholder capitalism, having um, nonprofits and government leaders, just like uh, Lisa Jackson used to run the EPA and is on the board of Apple. What you can also see is, um, um, and sorry, I misquoted, the women on boards is up to 26%. Women in the um, workforce is up to 39%. Uh, um, and you can see the managers in between. So um, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, every year as the S&P 500 changes over, the new companies may not yet have a woman. That usually is now getting fixed uh, within weeks. Um, and so all S&P 500 companies today have at least one woman on the board. 
but almost none have more than 50%, just a handful like L'Oreal. Um, okay, so what can we do about it? What are ways to get practical about it? Um, so the good news is, uh, and this has been accelerated by COVID, during the last decade since 2010, sustainable responsible investing has become more prevalent and it's been put on hyper growth uh, in the last year with COVID as people have said, oh, there's a lot of crises we need to solve for. Um, one of the things we do is we look at 10,000 companies uh, around the world, 85 countries. Um, and what we're looking at is for these metrics that we talked about, women on the board, greenhouse gas emissions, employee pay, are companies tilting more towards the positive or more towards the negative? And what we find is over time is um, a company like Pepsi versus Coke. You, you know, you may not like either of these because they sell sugar water and processed foods. What's interesting is that they're diversifying into more sustainable foods. It's still not the majority of what they do, but some investors like, okay, they're making progress or they see the vision and they're working their way there. For some investors, that's okay. There's other investors that say, I want nothing to do with Pepsi. But let's just take the Coke and Pepsi challenge. Some of you might remember this from growing up. There's a TV of which tastes better. And one of the interesting things is Coca-Cola is a 100% beverage company and Pepsi is a half food, half beverage company. And one of the interesting things about water usage, if you look at the last line, is even though Coca-Cola is only twice as much beverage as Pepsi, it uses four times more water. Now that's amazing. And you know, it's not just the water that goes in the, it's the water in processing farming the ingredients and the like. So if you drink a unit of soda, in general, you're drinking two to three units of water consumption. It's not going into your body, but that's what was used to produce it. And you can see that Pepsi has, you know, is, has some other advantages over Coke. And so if you said, am I gonna pick Pepsi or Coke from a sustainability perspective, maybe you pick Pepsi if you're okay with that whole category. So things are growing fast. And, um, uh, and what you can see on this chart on the right is, the higher rated sustainability companies, the companies who are doing better or doing good, but at least doing better, tend to rate higher and tend to have higher returns over a period of several years. And ones that rate lower actually are riskier and more volatile and don't always deliver the return. So it's not all companies over all time periods. It's a mix in a portfolio. This is a mix of all 10,000 companies that we track around the world. And so what you um, start to, you know, if you have a financial advisor, if you have a family member that you're investing with and they're like, oh, isn't that all tree hugging? It's not tree hugging. I mean, it is tree hugging, but it's also can be profitable tree hugging. So that's the, um, uh, uh, I'll just pause here because uh, we have some more questions if you want to answer and then we'll get into tools you can use. Leah, do you want to call okay. out any questions here? Sure. Um, JC asks, how do you evaluate an ETF or mutual fund that claims to be ESG focused? Great. Yeah, so great question. Um, and I'll just preview what we're going to cover in a few minutes. If you go to fossilfreefunds.org, um, there's several different filters that they use They for deforestation and um, for gender equality and the like. So you can type in a mutual fund name or ticker. Um, there's also included in our PDF here, uh, a website called Clean Portfolios that does something similar to show you what the overall sustainability rating can be. And um, there is some data now like on Yahoo Finance, you can see a sustainability score from a company called Sustainalytics, which is owned by Morningstar. Um, and so they have a view on it. So there's a couple different ways you could go about it. We also have a portal at Hip Investor that you could sign into and see um, some of the uh, sustainability uh, metrics and scores. Um, so uh, I see another question called uh, SRI and ESG. Um, SRI historically is called socially responsible investing. It's more recently called sustainable responsible investing. Some people call it sustainable, responsible impact investing. It's the process of applying these criteria about people, planet, and trust to your portfolio. Uh, ESG stands for environmental social governance. Again, people, planet, and profit. Um, 
they're directionally the same. Some applications are more intense, some are more loose. Some people saying they're doing either of these things can get accused of greenwashing or impact washing. So those are the high level definitions. This is why we like to get quantitative of what are actual metrics of like actual employee pay, actual CEO pay, actual board diversity, actual greenhouse gas emissions, actual product impacts. And that helps to sort of tune up the level of understanding and accountability. Uh, Leah, other questions? Yeah, how do you reconcile the presence of some vanity met metrics versus the real impact, often negative, of companies? How do the different metrics offset or balance each other? Is there some net score? Yeah, so great question. And yes, this is a challenge because there is a net score. Um, and high environmentally beneficial companies like Tesla don't disclose a lot. Uh, especially about their employee base. And so Tesla could rate high or low, depending on how you weight those factors. Um, one of the things I think Anoop, uh, thanks for these intelligent questions, is asking about is, you can see on this graph on the right, um, why are there no bars for 80 to 90 and 90 to 100? There are no companies performing at that level, at least in the public markets globally. Um, and so what we see is, the majority of companies are below 50. They're in this net negative, tending towards dystopian, tending towards our body temperature of 105 degrees or higher. To be a public company today is to be an extractive enterprise. So step one is to say, well, do I want to be invested in those companies that are contributing to the problem and maybe are going to face higher future risks? Or do I at least want to take the best available solutions? And it may not even be in all industries. You could exclude things like oil and gas from your portfolio. And that's what the right-hand side of this chart is about. The right-hand side of the chart is companies that are, do, that are leading or doing better or innovating, reducing their future risk, solving a problem that exists in the world, um, and bringing together people who will help solve it. So that's, uh, we could have an, days long discussion about this one, but I'll just pause there. Uh, Leah, other questions? Yes, what is the EEO1 counterpart for environmental impact? There is no required government disclosure equivalent to EEO1. This is an awesome question from JC. Um, the closest are OSHA requirements about some emissions and EPA requirements about some emissions, usually related to manufacturing or uh, mining. Um, but I've had direct debates with SEC commissioners on this about, hey, let's bring the greenhouse gas emissions methodology that's been in place for 20 or more years where thousands of companies have reported on this voluntarily, let's mandate that for US company disclosure. And at least with some of the more conservative SEC commissioners I've spoken with, they're like, oh, it's different by each industry. and That's not our job. So that will probably change during the current administration versus previous administrations. Um, but this is where each of us on this call um, uh, should contact our representatives who fund the SEC and pressure, especially the Financial Services Committee to bring this type of um, disclosure um, and transparency to it. You can also do it directly with companies. You can write investor relations, you can tweet at the company, uh, you can do social media. So all of us need to apply pressure both verbally and in writing um, in what we buy, buying products from companies who are leading versus lagging. Um, and continue to put this pressure on. But this is, a, this is great. Yeah, I'd love to see more of uh, this required disclosure versus voluntary disclosure. But it's happening today as, as more investors are thinking about this type of and allocating. You're seeing companies say, oh, what do we need to do to keep those investment dollars or purchases? Leah, more questions? Yes. Um, how could one go about converting their conventional portfolio to a more sustainable one? What are the steps? And doesn't it cost more for a company to have sustainable practices? And doesn't this make them less profitable? Or is this a misconception? All right, great question, common question, and very thoughtful. I'm gonna start with the last question first. Um, and that last question is, does it cost more? 
It might, but does it return more? It does often. And that's what you can see on this chart is the companies who might spend more or invest more in sustainable solutions for people, planet, and trust in general are more profitable and less risky. And that's what we've done the 15 years that I've been doing this at HIP when I started the company 15 years ago, there are versions of this chart every year where higher rated sustainability companies might pay more for employees, but those employees are more productive. They might take more care of the environment, but they're not drilling empty wells of water. They might spend more to not break the law versus taking the low cost approach, but they're not getting sued. And so the cost question here is maybe it's more costly, but you need to say, what is the return on investment of investing in people, of treating uh, nature as a resource to preserve and thrive? and of preserving trust, building and preserving trust. So return on investment is the key metric, not only cost, but return on investment. Because when we only focus on cost, that's how we get minimum wage at $7 an hour in some states. And that's, that is not a sustainable way of living, let alone investing. All right, so let's say, what can we do? So one thing you can do is look across your whole portfolio. Some of these may apply to you, some not. Uh, those of you on this call, if you have a public portfolio, you're probably in equities. You might be in some real estate or real estate investment trusts. You might even be in some bonds or muni bonds, um, and then even cash. So one easy way to get started is, where's my cash? Who, you know, is it at Citibank or is it at a community bank? Um, and community banks do a lot of community investing. So there's something called CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. There's also credit unions. Now you don't need to put all your money in one place, but you could put some of it there. Um, and then there's a, a investment called C-Note, my C-Note, M-Y-C-N-O-T-E. And they invest in uh, a mix of community banks and they make loans, those banks make loans to women and people of color who are entrepreneurs. And then it pays 2% and maybe more. So you can make more money than cash at a bank by investing in the community. For muni bonds, if you hold any of those, especially some of you might hold those um, uh, both for you know, ballast or safety in your portfolio and to generate income, an increasing number of muni bonds are being issued as green bonds or blue bonds related to water, green related to energy and environment. And so that um, is a way to get started. And there are some mutual funds and ETFs that are called sustainable muni bond funds. Um, so that's another type. Then there's equities, either direct companies. Well, we mentioned some companies before like Tesla, Beyond Meats. There's a new one uh, out this year called Vital Farms, uh, though that hasn't done well since its IPO, um, which has you know, free range uh, chickens and eggs. Um, so there's companies uh, and then there's funds. Um, so let's get to some tools for funds. Um, and again, we'll share this uh, document with you. So here's Kristen uh, Magnuson. She's an architect. Um, she works at a company here in San Francisco called Stoke, S-T-O-K. Um, and Stoke uh, not only has young people and middle-aged people and older people who are making buildings greener for their clients, they have a 401k that's more sustainable. And so um, we mentioned As You Sow before, which works on helping investors become more sustainable. Uh, and inside the company, they've adopted this. So it's not just you yourself, it's a group of people inside your company that can help make your 401k more sustainable. And we do this for Stoke and we do this for others. And this even got covered in Fast Company Magazine uh, five years ago, back in 2016, about how to make your 401k more fossil-free, more sustainable. And most people want this. Most this is not this is a no-brainer for most people. They do believe that sustainability matters. They'd like their portfolios to represent this, uh, represent um, uh, making the world better. So three tools that you can um, look at are uh, cleanportfolios.com, fossilfreefunds.org, um, and the Hip Investor Portal that we have as well. And in cleanportfolios.com, one of the things you can see uh, is like, well, what do, what do other companies offer in their 401k? 
And so one of the companies that we've loaded in uh, to this clean portfolio site is the Google 401k plan. Only one of the 24 funds in this Google 401k is socially responsible. And on average, most of the other funds have exposure um, to that. So you can pick like when you wanna retire and what's important to you like environment or equality. And then what you can see is to compare and contrast different um, funds. And you can see that some funds are more sustainable and some funds are less sustainable. Some funds have more fossil content, some have um, less. You can even see the socially conscious, one other resource is the US Sustainable Investment Foundation, US SIF. Uh, this TIA Cref Fund is one that has expressly purpose of um, uh, being sustainable. So it takes a little bit of research. There's some online tools that can help you. And, um, uh, and this is a tool where you could then make a new portfolio and say, well, what happens if I, if I put some of this in? So um, if I allocate in this way, how does my overall sustainability score change? So that's uh, one tool. A second tool, uh, which is now like a series of tools is fossil free funds. And when you go to fossil free funds, they have gender equality funds, deforestation tree funds and the like. So this is by uh, our nonprofit partner, as you saw. Um, and when you click into a particular fund, Parnassus is a local company in San Francisco on Market Street. Um, this is their Endeavor Fund, which invests in companies that are good places to work. Uh, and there's no fossil oil. There's no oil, gas, coal, or fossil utilities. In others, like you saw in the Google plan, there might be 5%, 8%, 10% in fossil. And if you think that that's either contributing to a world you don't want to live in or risky for your portfolio, um, those are um, choices you can make to then uh, pick new funds. Um, Morningstar has analyzed uh, sustainability and what they've found, and I need to update this chart, but the data is similar, is more sustainable funds are outperforming uh, currently. And whether those be equity funds or uh, muni bond funds or uh, allocation funds, which is a mix of stock and bond funds. Um, and so in general, not all the time, but in general, uh, sustainable funds are investing in companies and muni bonds and corporate bonds that are less future risk and more upside potential from solving these problems. So let's just pause there for more questions. Um, we still have another 10 minutes or so, nine minutes or so for questions. And, um, uh, and my contact, I'll put up my contact information too, in case you wanna write any questions to me, but I'm happy to answer these on the call together and keep going. So Leah, what's next? As an investor yourself in impact investing, do you feel frustrated at the pace of change of priorities, both companies, institutional investors and retail investors, especially given the potential dire consequences, are there interventions for more direct action? Yeah, so I'll put this to-do list back up here. Um, am I frustrated? Yes. Am I optimistic? Yes. So I'm a uh, short-term worrier, long-time optimist. And the good news is, more and more people are getting mobilized by these five crises of COVID and income inequality and climate crisis and racial inequity and lack of trust in institutions. Like these are dramatic problems, but there are young, middle-aged and old people who are solving these problems. And they're doing that in business, social and government institutions, as well as in military and academic sectors and the like. So bringing this cross-sector approach, one of the things that um, is really exciting is, I'll just go backwards here, um, is like the city of San Francisco and other cities have a need for um, climate action. Now, most of these cities are not funded for the climate action. Like we're just trying to like serve all the citizens as it is. So some of the solutions are gonna to have to come from not only the muni bonds of San Francisco, but partnerships with corporations. So in Sunnyvale, Apple has made partnerships with the surrounding towns and cities for the water supply as it continues to grow. Or Google has partnerships for transportation with Caltrain. Um, and so these cross-sector partnerships, you know, looking for companies who are solving um, sustainable development goals. Another reason for optimism is 
this is a framework, the SDGs, you're gonna to start to see more of this in um, uh, the investment markets. You're gonna see companies who are already committing to SDGs, sustainable development goals, there's 17 of them. These are all the things that could be better in the world, like no poverty, gender equality, good health and well-being, and clean water. And you're seeing funds, mutual funds and ETFs um, start to adopt these SDGs. And those solutions are gonna come from companies, they're gonna come from governments, and they're gonna come from nonprofits. And we're gonna see cross-sector solutions happen. So ways to get involved are one, vote with, vote with your time and your money. So where you shop matters. Every company uh, looks at its revenue every day, if not every week. Um, and so make a different purchasing decision, support a product that is more sustainable. Where you work, so work at a place that you feel good about, especially since you probably work hard, work at a place that's helping make a difference in these types of solutions. How you invest, while we're all here today to discuss your portfolio, start to shift your portfolio or shift all of it up to you, um, but with either 1%, 10%, 50% or all 100%, shift to a more sustainable portfolio and do that with other people, friends, family, or do it at work with your 401k. Um, and then how you vote. It still matters how you vote and uh, people who believe in science uh, are needed and we need to elect more scientists and doctors and biologists, but we also need to you know, elect people who can compromise um, and, and find solutions uh, in our difficult world that we live in today. So that's a mix of things that uh, we can do. And then if you don't like how a certain uh, in company or investee is behaving, call them up, write a letter. I don't think anybody still has fax machines. Social media is a good way to do it because then other people can pile on and you can share it. Write an op-ed, write on medium.com or linkedin.com. There are many more tools each of us have. And then from time to time, the SEC will have new rules that they're proposing. The 401k rules are gonna be updated soon again through the Department of Labor. Write create a public comment through that public comment process. Influence your local legislatures to put in place policies. So there's, so there's like a long list of things all of us can do, where we shop, where we work, how we invest, how we engage with those investments, how we vote, how we influence policy, how we bring other people along. And so one of the good things about social media is we can find others who wanna do that as well. And that helps us um, take collective action together. So there right. is another question, Paul. Um, does a total shareholder return mean dividends plus stock appreciation, or does yeah. it mean something else? Yeah. yeah, total shareholder return is what dividends you get paid, which are zero to five percent from a S and P five hundred company, averaging one to two percent usually for some funds, um, plus the stock appreciation or depreciation together. Um, and so that's the total shareholder return. That's what you get, whether you collect the dividends in cash or reinvest it in the stock. Uh, JC asks, mentioning banks, are there brokerage firms that are ranked for ESG? For instance, Vanguard seems to be quite popular in most retirement accounts, yet they only offer one ESG product to consumers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So let's see, so banks, um, there are community banks and credit unions. There's also sustainable banks. There's a sustainable bank called Aspiration. Um, so in big banks or in big investment firms, they're mostly moving in this way because in, investors want it, both individual investors like most of us here and institutional investors, endowments, foundations, pensions. So the good news is this is, remember I mentioned that hyper growth uh, earlier. This is happening now. It's, you know, more, more is happening. Some of it is a little bit greenwashing. Some of it's a little impact washing. For Vanguard, again, call them up, ask for it. You may need to ask to be escalated once or twice because the people on the front line may not know the answer. Um, there, there's the, from the Vanguard branded, there's the FTSE social good index that they've offered for quite a while. That's not always the best fund. Um, it's a fund, but it's not always the best fund. If you have a Vanguard account, you could pick non-Vanguard ones like Parnassus or Trillium. 
um, or ETHO, ETF, or Change Finance, or Green Alpha, Next Economy. So there are other non-big brand, uh, there are other funds that aren't necessarily the brand of the institution that can do the work. I do see a question here about the potentially higher expense ratio. It's the same thing about the cost of labor. If you wanna pick the cost of labor that's lowest, you won't necessarily get the best outcome. It's the same thing on a fund. You might pick the lowest cost, but remember that low cost index could be leading to a global body temperature, uh, could be leading to a global body temperature that will kill you. Um, and, and so what you're paying for with some of the fees is the ability to do this research, find these companies, engage with these companies. And remember, when we've done this analysis, we the net return you see in a mutual fund or ETF is the net return. They've already deducted the fees. So if you see a sustainable fund outperforming a traditional fund or an index, they've already deducted the fees. And many of those, you know, uh, there's a catalog of those that do better, even with some higher fees. So don't uh, be careful of limiting yourself just to the fees. It's true that fees are fixed or known and returns are unknown, but you also get what you pay for. And so in some cases, if you pick something lower cost, you may not get the best value. It's okay to pay higher fees sometimes if you're getting the value for it. If you're getting higher, if you're paying higher fees and not getting the value for it, that's a bad decision. Um, but this is, you know, uh, funds also change over time. They, you know, change their holdings. So remember, this is all for your education and information. These are not specific recommendations, but they are examples so that you can get to know them better. And, um, and this is what we do, you know, and have done every day for the past 15 years at, uh, uh, in how we rate investments, manage portfolios, and uh, advise people. Leah, anything else as we get close to wrapping up? You're on mute. I'm still connected. So, um, just give a quick screen share here. So, uh, as we mentioned before, we're um, happy to um, uh, we're happy to answer your questions, uh, follow up. We'll have the PDF um, shareable. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded. And, um, and then feel free to, to be in touch and, and be in contact, but just take action. It's up to us, you know, it's up to our, where we shop, where we work, where we invest, including our 401k and how we vote. So I'm so glad everybody could share this time together. Um, appreciate all the thanks in the, in the chat box and um, uh, excited for each of you to take action in your portfolio. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much, Paul. And um, again, we'll send the recording and the slides, and we will probably send the chat transcript as well. And we'll see you all at the next program. Thanks so much.